Okay, so, you know, um, kids, we put up our sermons on, on YouTube, right? So um, I had a family member from France who watches our videos, you know, and she's like, who won the quiz? You didn't tell us who won the quiz. So I had to tell her it was Team B. So I thought, well, seeing as we had so much fun last week with our quiz, for those who weren't here, we were going through John, um, and we had a bit of a quiz, and the kids had to listen carefully and answer some questions. And so far, Team A is winning. So we have sort of Team A, I'm sorry, Team B is winning, right? Team A is this one, and Team B is this one. So do you think you can do that again? Fudzi, you want to go on your, your team side later on when we do the questions? Or you want to be on Team B? <laughs> the winning team. <laughs> okay. All right. So this morning we're going to look at two chapters in John. Um, and the stories are very similar. Um, but there also are a few differences. So kids, I want you to pretend you are this investigative journalist, right? And you're going to listen closely to each of these two stories. And I want you to try to discover what are the similarities and what are the differences. And then we're going to have a bit of a quiz after we've read the scriptures. I'll give you a bit of a clue to help you. Shall I give Team A a bit of a clue? No? Look, Fuzzy's going, don't you dare. <laughs> okay, I won't. Okay, clues for everyone. Eight similarities and two differences. You got it? Eight similarities, two differences. All right, so join me now as we read chapter 5, and we're going to read the first few verses there up to um, 17, from 1 to 17. All right, let's begin. After these things, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there in Jerusalem, by the sheep gate, was a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethsaida, and it had five porticos. That's columns. In these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered, waiting for the moving of the waters. Now, not all um, versions of Scripture have this part, but some of them do, so I've included it. And it said, For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons in the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first, after the stirring up of the water, stepped in was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted. A man who was there had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been a long time in that condition, he said to him, Do you wish to get well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me in the water, into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, and another steps down before me, Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your pallet, and walk. Immediately the man became well and picked up his pallet and began to walk. Now it was the Sabbath on that day. So the Jews were saying to the man who was cured, It is the Sabbath, and it's not permissible for you to carry your pallet. But he answered them, He who made me well was the one who said to me, Pick up your pallet and walk. And they asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Pick up your pallet and walk? But the man who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd in that place. Afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, you have become well. Do not sin any more, so that nothing worse happens to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well. For this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But he answered them, My father is working until now, and I myself am working. Okay, so that's the story of the lame man. Now we're going to go to chapter 9. and It's a fairly long verse, but it's a great one to read. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. 
While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, Jesus spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. And he said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam. And Siloam means scent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, they asked. He replied, The man called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. And so they brought the, uh, to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he is a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said, this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had already decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. And he replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, Why did, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he said, I've already told you and you don't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, You are the fellow's disciple, this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. And the man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, You were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Now Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I might believe in him. And Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking to you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. And Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, what, are we blind too? And Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim to see, your guilt remains. So there we have two stories with many similarities and a few differences. So right, 
Team A, Team B, are you ready? Much better. <laughs> okay, right. So, what are the similarities first? Let me see who can get the most. Team A, Fuzzy. They were both on the Sabbath. Yes. Tick that box. Someone who's going to keep school for me because I was hopeless last week. Rudolph? Okay. Team A, okay. Right, what else? Similar length of time that they've been afflicted. One thirty-eight years, one about forty. Good. Okay, so two team A, team B. What's wrong with you this week? Come on, let's have some fun here. I'm on team B. Yes, I'm. Are you on team B? Yes. Oh, wonderful thing. I think Fuzz is in team A. <laughs> All right. Well, he he joined the winning team. <laughs> All right. Anything else? Tonight, yes. You're both, you're both. They were both healed by Jesus. Very good. That's three. Yeah, they were both healed on the Sabbath. Yes, that's what Fancy said. We've got that one already. Yeah. Neither of them could say who he was. Like they didn't. They couldn't describe him. Yes, they weren't sure he was. Yeah, that's four. Anybody else? And the Pharisees else? were blind. The Pharisees were blind. Yes. Very good. So where are we now? Three people that. Three, two, okay, it's coming up to know. Say again. Both reported to the Jewish leaders. Yes, they both reported to the Jewish leaders. That's very good. Okay, so one more for team B. Tonight, yeah. The Pharisees didn't believe they were healed. The Pharisees didn't believe any of the men. Yeah, so what is that? Five from team B. Five from team B. So we've got now how many? About six or seven, so one more. Who's going to win? Let's see. Jesus walked away wanting to perform the miracles and so that he didn't want to pray. Yes, that's right. Okay, so that's okay. Okay, so what was the final score? Five for team B, three for team A. Fuzz, do you think you've got an extra one? They both believe. Did they both believe? In Jesus? Are you sure? <laughs> All right, let's recap and we'll see. So, I, I didn't do the hard work. I, I consulted a scholar on this. <laughs> How's that? Okay, so here are the similarities. In the past, their past life was described, as Nigel said, yes. So the lame man had been in his state for 38 years, and the blind man was um, blind since birth. Did you notice that Jesus took the initiative with both men? He walked over to them. They didn't ask him over. He walked over to both of them. And there was something else that was similar. Where did they have to go and wash or jump in? Yeah, there, were water, there was water, yeah. Say again. So the pool of Bethsaida and the pool of Siloam, yeah, that's right. And then both were healed on the Sabbath, so ever said that, well done, very good. And um, we'll talk more about that next week. In both stories, Jesus is accused of violating the Sabbath, and that means breaking the Sabbath rules. Both men were questioned about who healed them. And after they had been questioned by the Jewish leaders, did you notice Jesus came to find both men? And he had a conversation with them. And the last similarity there is when Jesus finds them, he invites belief. So up until this point, Jesus responds to both of these men in a similar way. And now the ball is in their court. How will these men respond to Jesus? And it's here that we begin to see some differences. In John 5, it's interesting, Jesus implies in his conversation with the man at the end that the lame man's sin is related to his suffering. While in John 9, the blind man is not blind because of sin. There's a, a contrast there. What's going on? That's quite interesting. And this is a very complex issue. So let me try and explain this. In ancient times, many cultures 
incorrectly believed you were cursed by God if you were suffering in such a way. And Jesus' disciples themselves asked Jesus the question. They say, is, the, is sin the root cause of the blind man's situation? But Jesus corrects them. He says, this is not the case. But you can not kind of understand why they might think about this. I mean, we've read the, New, the Old Testament where God himself punished people for their sins by sending plagues, right? You remember? What was the story where God sent plagues on people? Do you remember? Tonight? Yes. Correct. Sent it on to Egypt. That's excellent. Well done. And then also onto the Israelites, actually, into the, in the wilderness, when they started to grumble against God or when they worshipped other gods. But it was interesting because even though this was at God's hand, we, he always provided a way out. So those who repented, he restored to full health. So then other than Job, which is entirely another sermon, (laughs) we don't hear of any innocent person suffering in this way. It's just not godly to say that. We also see in the Old Testament, though, that some people were not allowed to be with the rest of the community and were considered unclean if they had diseases that were contagious, like leprosy. And while we might think that's unfair and unkind, actually it's very similar to what we had to do when we all went into lockdown, right? (laughs) So it was instituted by God to protect people from getting sick in a time where there were no antibiotics or vaccines. Life was very hard for people in those situations. The only livelihood they could really earn was through begging. There was no sickness or disability benefit like we have here in New Zealand. It was a very bleak life. And yet, here comes Jesus and he turns this horrible culture on its head. Not only did Jesus hang out with sinners, but he bridged barriers and showed love to those who were sick or disabled. Those on the margins of society, Jesus heals both men And not only is this a blessing and a release for them from their physical hardship, but it also restores them to a more hopeful future. In both cases, it's not just a healing event, but a life-changing one. And you think we would have moved past this sort of thing in our culture today. Uh, But I can remember in the past when my mom was chronically ill, someone who was a Christian came to tell her she didn't have enough faith. Have you heard that before? Yes, unfortunately, that gets spread around too. That is rubbish, of course, and it's not the truth. God is not the kind of God to punish people uh, with illness. Else why would he have died on the cross? If people become very sick, it's generally a result of our broken world. You see, when sin came into the world, it corrupted creation. You know, kind of like a computer virus corrupts your computer and you can't do much with it. (laughs) You need to get an expert to fix it. Creation was broken and so in some ways is the human body. So for most of the time, this is the reason why people suffer, not because of sin. It's not anything to do with them. They've done nothing. However, it is reasonable to say that if I eat too many lollies, or drink too much, or if I take drugs, let's say, then as a result of these unwise choices, we might become sick. Our bodies may be hurt. This is why Jesus points out the difference between the two men. And while the scripture doesn't tell us why the lame man's injury happened, we do know that Jesus is a good judge of character. He knows the hearts of men, so we have to trust his judgment. But we can also look at this man's character and make some judgment calls for ourselves. Perhaps you've heard that phrase, they shall be known by their fruit. This means we can see from a person's life whether they are good or bad. So how does this lame man's character Um, show us whether he's good or bad. Let's think about it. Okay, so apart from picking up his mat and walking, where he listened to Jesus, 
This man did not act on his own behalf. He did not actually say he wanted to be well, even though Jesus asked him the question. Rather, he grumbled and blamed others for his own inability to get into the water. Remember, he was lame, he wasn't paralyzed. It's realistic to believe that this man could have made some effort to help himself. We learn that it is the Sabbath when the man was healed and that he is accused of violating the Sabbath rule. And what does he do? He blames Jesus. Can you believe it? Someone who has just been healed, restored to life, and he betrays the man who has done all this for him. At first, he doesn't know Jesus' name, but when he discovers it, what does he do? He goes to the Jewish leaders and he tells them, I know who, who healed me, it's Jesus. And the Bible says Jesus faced persecution at that point because of it, and people wanted to kill him. Let's compare his actions to the actions of the blind man. The minute Jesus tells the blind man to go and wash his eyes, he does so with no hesitation. He also defends himself when some people say he's not the same man who was blind. He tells them, no, you're wrong. I am that man. And when they asked who healed him, the man knew who it was. He said, the man they call Jesus. And when the Pharisees investigate, this man defends Jesus to the point of being thrown out of the temple. This is very serious because the likelihood of him re-entering the temple to worship would have been non-existent at that point. He would have been banned for life. He also has a depth of knowledge of who Jesus is. The man answered, and I love this part in the scripture. He says, you can just visualize it. Now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not God, he could do nothing. Not from God, he could do nothing. And so this leads us to the last difference between the two men. Do you think you guys have figured it out? What's the main difference between these two men? Team A, now's your chance. <laughs> one was faithful, one was not. There was a heart response, right? It's interesting. The blind man's heart was open to believe in Jesus, while the lame man's heart was not. Here we see that Jesus responds to every one of us in the same way, with the same love, with the same mercy, and the same offer of grace. But at the end of the day, it's up to each one of us to decide whether or not we accept him. Yeah. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, we thank you that you are a God who loves us so deeply. You come to seek us out, Lord, each one of us, in our own situations, in our own place. And you come to show us love and grace and mercy. I pray, Lord, that our hearts would respond back to you in kind with gratitude for what you have done for us. Thank you for your faithfulness to us, Lord. Pray for all those that may be struggling with illness, who have had harsh things said to them, Lord. Pray that they may know that you love them so much and they are incredibly precious in your sight. So God, Transform our hearts. We don't want to be people who are blind in our hearts. We want to see fully to trust you with our lives moving ahead. In Jesus' name, amen.